People love patterns, and not only do we love them, we're really good at picking up on them. They're the basis for scientific discovery, and according to Millie from Team Umizoomi, they also count as math? But we also love patterns in our words. When we're kids, we love the recurring rhymes and Shel Silverstein poems, and as we grow, we transfer a lot of that enthusiasm over to our music. There's something that just feels good about the rhythm and predictability and all that kind of stuff, but what about patterns in our writing that isn't poetry and isn't music? What's it like, and what's the point? My name is Cale Prindle, and today we're looking at the repetition patterns, parallelism and anaphora, in this week's edition of Words from the Muck. Parallelism is what we call the repetition of a grammatical syntactical pattern. It's when we write a bunch of sentences or phrases in the same way, using the same kind of words in the same kind of order. Let's get straight to an example on this one, because parallelism is a lot easier to understand when you see it, instead of somebody just trying to explain it to you. In Mark Twain's Corn Pone Opinions, Twain claims that people believe what they believe because of the pressures that surround them, that our belief systems are kind of a monkey see, monkey do kind of a thing. Speaking in general terms, a man's self-approval in the large concerns of life has its source in the approval of the peoples about him, and not in a searching personal examination of the matter. Mohammedans are Mohammedans because they are born and reared among that sect, not because they've thought it out and can furnish sound reasons for being Mohammedans. We know why Catholics are Catholics, why Presbyterians are Presbyterians, why Baptists are Baptists, why Mormons are Mormons, why thieves are thieves, why monarchists are monarchists, why Republicans are Republicans and Democrats Democrats. We know it is a matter of association and sympathy, not reasoning and examination. When was this published? hundred years ago? Oh man, thank goodness there wasn't a comment section then. Here's what Twain is doing with his parallelism. After posing his claim that everybody, me, you, probably Twain himself, believes what we believe because of our surroundings, he provides the example of Muslims. But what Twain does that's great is he starts with something drastically different than the typical American at that time and starts drawing a tighter and tighter spiral to include religion and schools of thought closer to home. His pattern of why blank are blank puts each religion in the same category as his first example. Muslims are Muslims for the same reasons that Catholics are Catholics and Baptists are Baptists. Now, the reader at that time, and probably our time, could look at that and be like, yeah, those crazy religious people, they're all different from us. They don't even think about the... Wait, what? Us two... Hey, wait a minute! If you didn't already know, we should just make it clear. Nobody is safe from Twain's criticism. His parallelism allows him to quickly apply his thesis to a wide range of groups, keeping them close together. So he eventually lands with American-grown religion and political systems. And also, if you notice that thieves were sitting right there in the middle of that, it's pretty classic Twain. Getting all snarky and whatever. For another way to use parallelism, let's look at Malcolm Gladwell's offensive play. How different are dogfighting and football? Really? Do we just want fights to break out in the comments? Here we go. Gladwell discusses the studies conducted by Anne McKee, supervisor of a neuropathology laboratory, on brains of athletes after they've died. She has now examined the brains of 16 ex-athletes, most of them ex-football players. Some had long careers and some played only in college. Some died of dementia. Some died of unrelated causes. Some were old. Some were young. Gladwell continues his descriptions of the athletes, but his use of parallelism here is how he draws our attention to the variety of experience represented in these athletes. This essay discusses the damaging effects on athletes while competing, so his sentences follow a pattern that pull our attention to some of the more powerful ideas that all these players seem to be affected the young as well as the old, the short-lived careers and the lifelong ones. And just like Twain, Gladwell spirals his sentences tighter and tighter, making them shorter, sharper, so they stick in our brains better. It might sound like a lot of work to make sure that your sentences and phrases follow in each other's footsteps, and well, you'd be right, it is a lot of work. But sometimes you can set up patterns in different, less structurally demanding ways, like by using anaphora. Anaphora is something that you didn't even know was a thing, and basically it's the repeating the beginning of a line or phrase or sentence over and over again. It's kind of like green eggs and ham. I would not eat it with a chimp. I would not eat it on a blimp. I would not eat it on a lump. I would not eat it with Donald Trump. I think that's how it goes. I don't know, it's been a long time since I've read it. When Seuss writes Green Eggs and Ham, his use of anaphora means it's going to stick in your head for the rest of your life. I mean, if I wasn't making up lines, you probably could have finished a lot of those lines yourself. So when it's not kids lit, what does anaphora look like? Well, one really great example is from an essay called I Want a Wife. I want a wife who will take care of my physical needs. I want a wife who will keep my house clean. A wife who will pick up after my children. A wife who will pick up after me. 
I want a wife who will keep my clothes clean, ironed, mended, replaced when need be, and who will see to it that my personal things are kept in their proper places so I can find what I need the minute I need it. I want a wife who cooks the meals, a wife who is a good cook. I want a wife who will plan the menus, do the necessary grocery shopping, prepare the meals, serve them pleasantly, and then do the cleaning up while I do my studying. That's just a small sample. The whole essay is only a page and a half, and the phrase, I want a wife, shows up about 30 times. And if the piece sounds kind of weird and clearly sexist, well, that's the point. The author, Judy Brady, wants us to hear the phrase, I want a wife, over and over again, so that it sounds like a complainy-faced kid in a toy aisle to show the silly, but also sometimes very real expectations that some men have for their wives. That's what an African do. The repetition of the phrases stick into us. The beauty of it, though, is that once the phrase is laid down, the writer can build on it however they want. It doesn't follow the same sentence structure like your standard parallel structure does. Instead, it uses a short phrase as a launching pad, one that the writer can use Used to familiarize the reader with your concept, but then you can kind of steer them wherever you want. An effort isn't just to make fun of complainy faces, though. It can pack a powerful political punch. Sherman Alexie's Superman and Me discusses how reading impacted his life growing up on the Spokane Indian Reservation. And toward the end of the essay, Alexie makes a list of all the things he would read. I read the books my father brought home from the pawn shop in second hand. I read the books I borrowed from the library. I read the backs of cereal boxes. I read the newspaper. I read the bulletins posted on the walls of the school, the clinic, the tribal offices, the post office. I read junk mail. I read auto repair manuals. I read magazines. I read anything that had words and paragraphs. I read with equal parts joy and desperation. I loved those books, but I also knew that love had only one purpose. I was trying to save my life. And that's not all. In that larger paragraph, Alexi begins 13 sentences with the words, I read. Unlike Brady, though, Alexi uses anaphora not to annoy or show the childishness of others. Instead, his use of I read becomes desperate. The sentences get shorter and punchier, and the things he reads become less charming and academic. He's reaching for anything with words, so when we get to his last sentence about saving his life, we've gotten a sense of struggle and a need for words. But you know what's really cool? Alexi's paragraph is even more complicated because the last sentence before he launches into his 13 repetitions, I was lucky. That's just awesome! Thanks for watching Words from the Mock. If you're going to fight about the political, racial, feminist, or socioeconomic issues brought up in this episode's examples, uh, play peacefully, practice your parallelism, and your anaphora abilities. Of course, if you don't want to get into any comment conflict, we totally understand. Go check out some more wordly wisdom in our episode on anecdotes. Until next time, farewell good people.